With that, uh, I'm going to turn the, uh, the podium over to uh, Judge Stephen Williams of the uh, U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit, and uh, he will uh, moderate the uh, uh, panel on open-ended clauses of the Constitution, due process, privileges or immunities, the Guarantee Clause, and the Ninth Amendment. And if that's not enough to shove into an hour and uh, 45 minutes, I don't know what is. Judge Williams. The, uh, I'm moderator, but also speaker. Uh, the other moderators who were speakers uh, chose to speak first. Uh, my original inclination was to speak last so that I could correct errors that had been made by the others. Uh, uh, but I found over the course of the morning that enough error had been made already uh, so that I had enough to work on. And will <laughs> we'll therefore speak first. Um, I, in my former life as a law professor, I uh, was once chatting with a colleague about problem of the Supreme Court acting as a super legislature. Uh, and he observed that if they wanted to do that, all they needed was one clause. I was <laughs> about to ask, which is it? Uh, when he said, and it doesn't matter what it says. Uh, <laughs> I, there's a lot of truth in that. Obviously, uh, even Justice Brennan would be hard pressed to extract Roe versus Wade from the presidential age limitation. Uh, but uh, <laughs> the, the, the ability of, of judges to uh, extract attractive meaning from uh, the phrases the Constitution is, is certainly uh, enormous. I think no case better illustrates that than Bowling versus Sharp. You recall that is the uh, case in which the Supreme Court, in a page or two, uh, overturned a long line of previous cases uh, in which it had said that the Equal Protection Clause was quite different from the Due Process Clause, and there's no, nothing about the Due Process Clause that compels equal protection. And, uh, as I say, simply in a page, found a so-called Equal Protection component uh, within the Due Process Clause. The um, so that certainly that, the linguistic distinction between due process and equal protection, obviously is not a serious challenge to the Supreme Court. The, uh, what, I mean, I think my friend was basically right that um, before a determined judge, uh, it doesn't make a great deal of difference uh, what the Constitution says. There are, however, for, for judges not so minded, there are these troubling uh, clauses characterized by the drafter of the program as the open-ended clauses. And uh, the thoughts that I have are uh, addressed to judges who would try to read those in a way which does not turn the Supreme Court into a super legislature. I particularly want to focus on the 14th Amendment. The uh, uh, suggestion was made very strongly this morning uh, that while the Civil War amendments did not completely abolish everything that had gone before, uh, they very substantially did, and, and we shouldn't be so worried about uh, Madison and Framers in, uh, of his vintage uh, as we are. Uh, I think that enormously overstates the impact of the Civil War amendments, and I, I want to just work briefly through the three great, great clauses, or the three great phrases of the uh, 14th Amendment with some suggestions for uh, solutions that prevent the court from becoming a super legislature. Uh, as far as due process is concerned, uh, I, I think one can go back to the, the, uh, the history on that is fairly compelling. Uh, that's say the, the due process clause of the Fifth Amendment very clearly derives uh, over to be sure a course of more than 500 years uh, from language in Magna Carta, uh, essentially aimed at making sure that the king, going about criminal prosecutions, uh, adheres to uh, provisions laid down by Parliament. I say the, the phrase from Magna Carta is the law of the land. Over a course of uh, evolution, uh, that law of the land was rephrased as due process, but what it essentially was intended to mean, I, I think the record is reasonably clear, uh, was the same as the law of the land. That is to say, the process which was due was the process which was legislatively prescribed. So far as the interests protected by the due process clause are concerned, 
life, liberty, and property, the focus uh, unquestionably in the original Magna Carta phrase was those things which happened to you after an unsuccessful criminal trial. Life, execution, liberty, going to jail, property, having your goods confiscated. And so I think the, uh, that although clearly the language of the Due Process Clause is very broad, uh, and, and I, I, I do want to add that I'm not proposing an immediate return uh, to what I see as its original meaning. Uh, I think that it is not a serious embarrassment uh, to someone who is seeking to narrow the role of the courts. As far as equal protection is concerned, I think there's a similar answer. That is the, the answer that Justice Rehnquist uh, adheres to, uh, and that is that it was aimed at the problem of racial discrimination, period, full stop. And uh, that uh, eliminates it uh, as a general engine of uh, Supreme Court reform. The, the, the most difficult clause linguistically and historically, I think, is the Privileges and Immunities Clause. And it, it may seem quixotic to bother you with any thoughts about the Privileges and Immunities Clause. Uh, after all, it has been safely made a dead letter, uh, so why worry about it? Uh, it's true that it's been made a dead letter, but I think that to the extent that the Supreme Court, in applying the Due Process and Equal Protection Clauses, is able to draw upon the history of the 14th Amendment and draw upon suggestions in that history that the intended sweep was very broad, we have to face it. The, the mere fact that the broadest sweep intended by the draftsman of the 14th Amendment was, in fact, the, the, what was encapsulated in the phrase privileges and immunities uh, does not mean that merely because that particular phrase has been buried, courts, lawyers should be entitled to disregard the sort of broader meaning of what was intended at the time. Uh, I, I will not um, spend any time on the substantive meaning of the Privileges and Immunities Clause. Uh, I simply report to you that it, it seems to me the, uh, the rights potentially encompassed by that phrase are very broad, uh, that the legislative history, though vague on that, uh, suggests that Congress had a lot in mind in that phrase. Certainly, I, I don't mean that it could be wheeled out uh, for most or even uh, half of the Supreme Court decisions that trouble most of the people in this room. Uh, but I do think that in terms of, uh, of substantive breadth, breadth, it is uh, the Achilles heel of uh, opponents of judicial activism. I want to turn, therefore, to the, uh, I, the institutional aspect of it, and that is to look at the history of the 14th Amendment in terms of the relationship between institutions. Professor Ackerman, uh, in uh, not quite writing off, but uh, nearly writing off the pre-Civil War history, uh, implicitly found an enormous shift of power to the federal government, and it seems to me that that is hard to contest. Finding uh, an enormous shift of power from legislative bodies, state legislatures, and Congress to the courts, particularly the Supreme Court, uh, I think is much harder. When you turn to the uh, issue that Thomas Sowell hammered on uh, yesterday afternoon, the problem of who decides, uh, I don't think you will find much in the history of the 14th Amendment uh, that supports judicial supremacy. I want to, to uh, develop essentially three elements of that history. And this is, this is certainly by no means intended to be comprehensive. You'll be gratified to hear. Uh, the uh, first is the, the major focal point. The, the, the focal point, of course, was protecting the uh, enactments of Congress and the Civil Rights Act of 1866. That is to say, to make sure that uh, the Supreme Court did not undermine what Congress was attempting to do uh, in Reconstruction and in carrying out the essentially what it viewed as, as what it had obtained by victory uh, in the Civil War. The, given that context, Bowling versus Sharp is really a fantastic opinion. Uh, 
fundamental object was to protect Congress in its effort to achieve the proper treatment of freedmen from intervention by the Supreme Court. Bowling versus Sharp turns that completely around and establishes the Supreme Court as the suitable body uh, to protect blacks then, but uh, obviously much more broadly now, uh, to protect whomever it sought to protect uh, from the doings of Congress. That, that is surely a complete turning upside down of the underlying story of the 14th Amendment. Second point is that, as Professor Ackerman noted, the, perhaps it was uh, Professor Stone, Dean Stone, the uh, post-Civil War amendments overturned the Dred Scott decision. But again, it seems to me you have to look at another aspect of that. What the, at least one aspect of the Dred Scott decision was that it represented the, uh, certainly the most egregious, and I think it's uh, certainly the, the first serious uh, effort into uh, judicial adventurism uh, by the Supreme Court. And it, it seems to me uh, most implausible to infer from amendments aimed at correcting that a view that it was intended to license the Supreme Court to uh, develop its uh, charter for control of the country. Third historical point is Ex parte McCardle, which was alluded to uh, this morning. Uh, for those of you who have forgotten the wonderful incidents of Ex parte McCardle, basically General Ord, one of the Reconstruction commanders in the South, in Vicksburg, had uh, arrested a newspaper editor and was about to court-martial him. The newspaper editor's only offense uh, was to criticize Reconstruction, uh, I guess particularly General Ord. Um, it was a, a, an act... Uh, uh, without any uh, colorable jurisdiction, so far as I know. An, an egregious uh, point of behavior by the uh, Union commander. Uh, McArdle uh, sought relief in the form of habeas corpus, and in the great point on which people focus, Congress simply divested the Supreme Court of the jurisdiction. Right, to be precise, it simply divested the Supreme Court of the particular jurisdictional avenue that McArdle had tried, there were alternative avenues, but in any event, it uh, swept the court aside by means of a simple statute. Um, and, and the Supreme Court, as you know from the outcome in Ex parte McArdle, acquiesced in that. It seems to me there's, uh, there's a message in that in terms of the, what the people of the time viewed as the uh, suitable relationship between Congress and the courts. The suggestion uh, that the courts are entitled to the awe and to the exclusive control of the Constitution, which is now fashionable, uh, seems to me wholly belied by that episode. I, uh, I don't have a uh, specific agenda in terms of uh, proposed details, interpretations of the, of the 14th Amendment. Uh, for which, again, you may be uh, thankful. Um, but, but I do think that the, the history strongly suggests a healthful attitude towards approaching the broad language of, of those three great clauses, uh, and so that they, although in some ways uh, make a, a dutiful originalist interpretation difficult, that when one has regard not merely to the substantive intentions, but also to the institutional intentions of the participants in the adoption of the 14th Amendment, uh, it is less of a menace than it seems. Uh, now I'm going to uh, turn you over to the uh, other uh, speakers, and uh, uh, because no one has protested, uh, I'm simply going to follow the order that has been laid out uh, and start uh, with Professor Gralia. Professor Gralia, I think, needs little introduction. Re readers of uh, any of the important law journals and readers of any of the magazines that conservatives read are entirely familiar with his work. Uh, I felt honored at the thought that I was to be a moderator for Lino Gralia. That's an impossible task. Uh, <laughs> but I, I give you Professor Gralia.
Why Judge Williams should think that the age provision of the Constitution, which after all has depends on when you're born, has nothing to do with abortion, I don't understand. <laughs> That seems to me a failure of the legal imagination that makes me wonder, is he going to make it as an American judge? <laughs> Brennan has done more with less, Steve. <laughs> the topic I have been assigned, the open-ended clause of the Constitution, reminds me of a conversation I had a little while ago with a professor of classics. After telling me how much he enjoyed teaching Thucydides, the conversation somehow turned to money, and he expressed the view that it was terrible that law professors should be paid more than professors of classics. I told him the reason for this was clear. In his line of work, he gets to read Thucydides. In mine, I get to read Harry Blackman. <laughs> Surely he would agree that was worth a few bucks. <laughs> I thought when I read the cities after all, I don't get paid either. <laughs> uh, my topic uh, reminds me of this because I now realize I could have also pointed out to him that I also have to read the works of Ronald Dworkin, John Hart Ely, Jeff Stone, Bruce Ackerman, and countless others explaining why the Constitution, properly understood, embodies the social and political thought of George McGovern. <laughs> My topic makes me painfully aware that being a professor of constitutional law is not only onerous, but embarrassing. <laughs> to have to speak in public on the open-ended clauses of the Constitution is like being invited to a gathering of learned people and assign the topic of the Easter Bunny. <laughs> what could one say? I'd undoubtedly say something like, ladies and gentlemen, my research has indicated that the Easter Bunny is a figure of transcendental and overreaching importance in the contemporary American scheme of values, a figure held in deep affection by many Americans, albeit usually in inverse proportion to age. <laughs> However, ladies and gentlemen, I would have you know that I am a no-nonsense, hard-headed realist. And I must therefore further report to you that my research has also indicate, hold on to your seats, the evidence for the Easter Bunny is sketchy. <laughs> I hate to have to break this news, and probably your hearts, but serious scholarship is serious scholarship, and that's just how it is with the Easter Bunny. That would be my contribution to the advancement of human understanding at that gathering. Is it really my function in life, I ask myself, and if so, is it a respectable function to be forever rebutting the preposterous? <laughs> my Easter Bunny today is the open-ended provisions of the Constitution. And it is my embarrassing duty to have to make the unsurprising announcement that there really are no such provisions. The evidence for their existence is sketchy. I am here to tell you, hold on to your seats, that the Constitution does not really authorize the Supreme Court justices to make up constitutional laws they go along in accordance with their policy preferences. The basic principles of the Constitution are federalism and democracy that is, decentralized representative self-government, and the existence of open-ended, that is, unlimited constitutional provisions. A blank check for Supreme Court policymaking would obviously be inconsistent with those two basic principles. None of this, however, has prevented a debate on the subject of the open-ended provisions from raging in constitutional law circles. At least it would be a debate, except for the fact that one side has so few debaters. There is, on the one hand, a tiny group of rigid and unimaginative people who keep insisting that the Constitution should have something to do with constitutional law. I'm reluctant to call these people scholars because the position is so obviously unscholarly. Indeed, it is exa exactly the view you'd expect from, say, a truck driver. <laughs> This odd school of thought 
is, of course, in need of a name, and it's called interpretivism. And its practitioners are called interpretivists. There is, on the other hand, an overwhelmingly larger group of enormously more sophisticated and subtle constitutional scholars who favor that form of constitutional interpretation known as non-interpretation. And they, of course, are known as non-interpretivists. This position, of course, requires real scholarship. <laughs> Indeed, most truck drivers probably don't even realize that non-interpretation is an interpretational option. <laughs> constitutional non-interpretation is, of course, extremely important for constitutional law. In fact, it is hardly too much to say that except for the Supreme Court's many and insightful non-interpretations, there wouldn't be any constitutional law to speak of. Without non-interpretation, I would have a very small and dull subject to teach. But because of it, I have a very large and important one. And one with all the charm and fascination of not making a bit of sense. <laughs> Just how dull and unimportant this subject would be without non-interpretation is illustrated, I think, by an exchange I recently had with a well-known media personage specializing in law. I was explaining in a public debate that the Constitution actually places very few restrictions on self-government, and that these are fairly clear and well-defined. That is, the Constitution doesn't have any open-ended provisions. I pointed out that legislators, therefore, ordinarily have very little difficulty in keeping within the bonds of the Constitution, the bounds, and that nothing in the, nothing in the Constitution, for example, prohibits state restrictions on abortion or pornography, or provision for prayer in the schools, and so on. The media personage was shocked. But according to your theory of constitutional interpretation, Professor Gralia, she said, nothing would be unconstitutional. And she thought she'd really put me on the spot by asking, could you give me an example of a state law that you would consider unconstitutional? I wasn't sure that my view that the Constitution should be read as written really should be dignified with the title of a constitutional theory, but I had no trouble in answering. Sure, I said, if a state passed the law that women can't vote, that would be unconstitutional. That would violate the 19th Amendment, and if I were on the Supreme Court, I'd knock it right out. <laughs> no unconstitutional laws would get past me. <laughs> Well, instead of being relieved to hear this, she was for some reason enormously disappointed, as if I'd played an unfair trick. But, she said, no state would pass such a law. Of course, I said, legislators can read. <laughs> the point is that merely interpreting the Constitution would leave the Supreme Court with very little to do. The country would have to get by as best it can with policy making by elected representatives. <laughs> Which Justice Brennan sees as an insuperable objection to any such approach. We don't really need the Supreme Court to interpret the Constitution. We need it, or at least constitutional law scholars need it, only for its important non-interpretation, or to use Phil Curlin's terms, not for constitutional construction, but for its constitutional deconstruction. <laughs> the notion that the Constitution contains open-ended provisions comes primarily from the work of Dean John Hart Ely, building on and designed to support the work of Ronald Dworkin. Ely's extensive studies of the Constitution and its history have caused him to reach the perfectly incredible conclusion that the framers of the Ninth and Fourteenth Amendments issued to our judges, quote, open and across the board invitations to import into the constitutional process considerations that will not be found in the amendments, nor even at least in any obvious sense elsewhere in the Constitution. What this means is a practical matter, of course, is that these amendments can be made to mean anything and, uh, in effect, simply constitute blank checks to judges to enact their policy preferences into law and relieve the rest of us of the burdens of self-government. Are there really no limits at all to these constitutional provisions, according to Ely, you might ask? <laughs> 
For example, doesn't the 15th Amendment's prohibition of race discrimination in granting the right to vote conclusively establish that that is at least one thing that the 14th Amendment did not do? Not at all, says Ely. Indeed, in an argument that I'm not sure I fully understand, he states the exact contrary is true. That the very passage of the 15th Amendment bolsters his view that it was unnecessary. <laughs> that the 14th Amendment does apply to voting and Roald Berger be damned. <clears throat> After all, he says, quote, recent studies have shown that the 15th Amendment was supported by essentially the same people who supported the 14th. Unquote. As for the Equal Protection Clause, Ely argues that its purpose was apparently, was quote, apparently to state a general idea whose specific application would be supplied by posterity, unquote. Posterity, he might have added, turned out to be Justice Brennan. <laughs> According to Ely, quote, the constitutional text doesn't give us a clue, unquote, as to the purpose of the Equal Protection Clause, except that it has something to do with equality. Surely the most disturbing thing about constitutional law scholarship today is this sort of thing can get you the deanship at Stanford. <laughs> All that it should be necessary to say in response to Ely's position is that although the blank check theory is absolutely essential to his mission of defending the decisions of the Warren Court, there is no good reason to believe that it is what the framers of the 14th Amendment or any other constitutional provision intended, and every reason to believe that it is not. As Tom Sowell correctly pointed out uh, yesterday, we know what the 14th Amendment was meant to achieve as well as we need to know. We know that it was adopted to provide certain basic protections to blacks, and that, as the court said in its very first consideration of the amendment, it would not even have been suggested except for that purpose. This may seem too limited a goal in this morally advanced age when the Supreme Court has already brought us to the very edge of perfection, but it seemed the goal enough at the time. In any event, and even more to the point, we know almost as well as we know anything of this sort what the 14th Amendment was not intended to do. We know, for example, that it was not intended to restrict the power of the states to regulate abortion, to provide for prayer in the schools, to make distinctions between men and women, or to provide for capital punishment. There is not only no reason to think but it is simply beyond belief that the framers of the 14th Amendment intended to take decision-making power on these matters away from the states and turn it over to the Supreme Court that had just recently rendered the, the Dred Scott decision. To argue that the Ninth Amendment, adopted to quiet fears of an expansion of federal power, can properly serve as a tool to expand federal power and further limit state policymaking is, if anything, even less credible. It is difficult to resist the conclusion that such arguments result more from approval of the results the Supreme Court has reached than from an impartial search for knowledge. Of course, if the, court did, if the Constitution did contain open-ended provisions, it would be inconsistent with the basic justification for judicial review, namely that the judges merely carry out the will of the people and do not engage in policymaking. Uh, as, as John Marshall uh, explained it, if the Constitution provides, as it does, that you need two witnesses for the federal crime of treason, if a federal statute said one witness, that would be unconstitutional. Could you imagine John Marshall explaining how he would interpret the open-ended provisions of the Constitution? Finally, I would argue that even if it should somehow be determined, incredible as it seems, that the Constitution does contain open-ended provisions, unlimited grants of policy-making power to the courts, our first order of business should be to see that such grants are removed. Indeed, even Ely agrees that, a grant, that such a grant cannot be tolerated, but would be, as he puts it, scary that the court has policy-making power. He finds that scary after giving us this whole theory, but we have nothing to worry about. It's scary, but fortunately we have nothing to worry about at present, he tells us, 
because the Supreme Court can, according to his theory, only use these open-ended clauses for what he calls representation reinforcing purposes, which he, he mistakenly believes uh, would not involve policy making. Given, however, that his theory justifies all of the Warren Court's decisions, including uh, Griswold and its penumbras, and that I am not sure that Justice Brennan really listens to Ely, I am less than totally reassured. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Floyd Abrams, a uh, distinguished First Amendment attorney. He argued uh, many times in the Supreme Court and even uh, on occasion in the D.C. Circuit. <laughs> Thank you, Judge Williams. I, I thought you might be interested, and then again, you may not, in why I come here. Uh, uh, <laughs> there are a few reasons. For one thing, you're really an interesting group of people, and if you see me staring at you a little bit hard sometime, that's just because when I go home, I want to tell my friends what you're like. Um, <laughs> Second, it, it you know makes me feel sort of brave and all that. You know, you're, you're not. That's that's just uh, self-enhancement. Um, third, if if I am one of the two on this panel, House uh, liberals, if you'll forgive the expression, we're supposed to be optimistic, hopeful. You are capable of change. The world can improve, and we're here to help you do it. But none of that is really true. I'm really here because of the odds. Last year, I was on a panel at Stanford, the Federalist Society, which before I got up to speak, people started telling me there's a, as a future Supreme Court justice there. And there are people from the administration in the audience, and they're looking. And I looked around, Professor Groglia was there, just as eloquent, soft-spoken, <laughs> subtle, moderate, <laughs> as today. I figured maybe not this year for him. <laughs> Professor Epstein was there, thought maybe, you know, Maybe this isn't his year. And there was me and some judge. Well, Judge Scalia got it. But <laughs> this year, one person is back. Uh, and maybe next year, uh, I have a judge on my uh, left who, who is brilliant, but very young. He can wait. A judge on my farther left, and maybe they want to see how he works out, how his opinions play out and a bearded representative from the American Civil Liberties Union. <laughs> so, here I am again. Uh, <laughs> there are clauses in the Constitution, uh, and there are clauses in the Constitution. Some are clearer, at least, than others. Uh, the Fifth Amendment, for example, which has recently gotten a new degree of respectability by the social class and place in the administration from people who choose to take it, uh, is pretty clear on its face. Uh, oh, come on, come on. That's why I'm here, come on. <laughs> The First Amendment, at least I argue to judges, is reasonably clear. Uh, there will be some fringe cases, not the ones I'm involved in, but fringe <laughs> cases where we're not entirely sure what the right answer is. But, but th there's a lot of history, and there's even some pretty good language uh, in the First Amendment, which sort of leads you from a beginning to an end of most First Amendment cases, and indeed keeps a lot of matters out of the courts because they're so clearly governed by the First Amendment. But there are some other clauses. Uh, they're a lot harder for me than they are for uh, Professor Graglia uh, and, and some others to figure my way out of in terms of offering you, even the other side, if you will, but offering you my own side as to, as to how to make one's way through them. I take the Ninth Amendment, for example, uh, as one example. Uh, it says, for those of you that don't recall the text, the enumeration in this Constitution uh, 
of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. It is a construction amendment. Uh, it plainly, I would urge upon you, was adopted for a very narrow purpose in response to a very important but narrow objection to the adoption of any Bill of Rights at all. Alexander Hamilton and others had opposed the adoption of a Bill of Rights, at least in part, on the grounds that to start enumerating rights might permit the disparagement of others. And James Madison, uh, on the floor of the House of Representatives, said that it has been objected also against a Bill of Rights, that by enumerating particular exceptions to the grant of power, it would disparage those rights which were not placed in that enumeration. And it might follow by implication that those rights which were not singled out were intended to be assigned into the hands of the general government and were consequently insecure. This, said Madison, is one of the most plausible arguments that I have ever heard against the admission of a Bill of Rights, but I conceive that it may be guarded against. And he said he had guarded against it by what ultimately became uh, the Ninth Amendment. The Ninth Amendment was adopted, as one scholar put it, simply to assure that by the enumeration of rights in the Constitution, nothing has been lost. That the rights of the people would have rested on as firm ground without enumeration. Now, that doesn't help us at all to answer the question of what other rights there may be in addition to those, let's, let's just limit ourselves to the Bill of Rights, in addition to those specifically enumerated in the Bill of Rights. And taking the easy case first, I'm focusing only on the federal government, not on the states. It doesn't answer that question at all. But it does answer the argument that if one does not find in the explicit provisions of the Bill of Rights a constitutional a prohibition against congressional action of one sort or another, that that in and of itself means that the congressional action is constitutional. It doesn't deal with the question of what role that the judiciary should play, if any, uh, although I would have thought that that had been passed upon in a variety of other circumstances, but it does answer the argument, I would say to you, answer it completely, that if we can't find a specific, narrow, clearly applicable clause of the Bill of Rights, which bars some action of Congress at least, that therefore it is a permissible action under the Constitution. And so, uh, I have found myself in my uh, real life, life, not on panels, although I sometimes wonder, in my real life life, I'm trying to persuade courts sometimes that even if the language doesn't really fit too well, uh, if it is what? Important enough, old enough, surely enough proved, that maybe, maybe the Ninth Amendment helps you to get to the point where you can say that some, quote, right, that's the question, of course, not the answer, some, quote, right, unquote, receives constitutional protection. In the Richmond Newspapers case, some of you may recall, which was decided by the Supreme Court in 1979, uh, the question before the court on a First Amendment basis was uh, whether uh, when courtrooms could be closed. Was there any constitutional right at all to have courtrooms open? Uh, the court had the year before held, or so it seemed, but under the Sixth Amendment, uh, there was no such right. That was the standard reading at the time, and that was my reading as well. And it was certainly not an absurd ruling based on the language of the Sixth Amendment. It's, it's defendant-oriented. No defendant shall be deprived of speedy public trial. Uh, it, it doesn't, by its own terms, answer the question of whether the public has any right to be at a trial at all. And neither, it seemed to me, does the First Amendment. It was a good First Amendment argument, but you needed a lot of penumbras to get from the, the mere language of the First Amendment to the proposition that there was any right for the public to attend any trial so long as the defendant and, let's say, the prosecution agreed on their exclusion. And that was one possible result. And for those of you that don't recall the opinion, that indeed was what Justice Rehnquist, alone on the court in the Richmond newspapers, believed was the result that there was no constitutional protection at all 
with respect to the openness of courtrooms if defendants and plaintiffs agreed. Uh, Chief Justice Berger, speaking for the court, made some use of the Ninth Amendment. Uh, he used it to bolster the First Amendment argument made to him, uh, and uh, he argued that there were uh, not enumerated rights which uh, the court had frequently recognized before and presumably properly recognized before. It seemed to me important to, to mention this case to you because it seems to me a paradigmatic one in that the country had grown up with open courtrooms at the time of the revolution, at the time of the Constitution, at the time of the Bill of Rights, up until the time in the late 1970s, quite literally in the late 1970s, when courtrooms started to be closed because a prosecutor didn't want a reversal on grounds of unfair trial, because a defendant uh, didn't want the public there, most defendants don't, uh, uh, to witness uh, his uh, agony and likely uh, a conviction. Uh, and it seemed uh, uh, to me at the time, and seems to me now, an oddity that the fact of a written constitution seemed to be a, a barricade against the courts ultimately saying, as they finally did, that there is some legal and constitutional protection for the openness uh, of trials. The legal barricade was that it didn't, in candor, fit very well within the Sixth Amendment, and at least it didn't fit awfully well within my own notion uh, of the First Amendment. And I think when we say, uh, or when it is argued to you, that the Ninth Amendment adds nothing, and there are distinguished jurists who have thought that as well, uh, when it is argued to you that, that there are no open-ended clauses of the Constitution, it seems to me that, that that really evades the really hard and and interesting but very hard issues. Uh, I think it's a given in the Constitution that there are open-ended, not easily definable, not easily predictable in their effect uh, uh, clauses of which that is uh, just one. And let me say that I think the Privileges and Immunities Clause, as Judge Williams observed earlier, is one which, for those of you that really care about original intent, ought to give you a lot of sleepless nights, because there is a lot of legislative history indeed, as Judge Williams suggested, which indicates not only in terms of the language of the Privileges and Immunities Clause, which is very sweeping, uh, but in terms of its history, that there was an intention to give to the residents of states the same protection as all citizens of the United States had in their federal capacity. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall, abri which, which, which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. If you are looking at language alone, people concerned about judicial activism would have a lot of problems. And if you're looking at legislative history alone, people concerned about judges just pouring their own values into the Constitution ought to have a very great concern indeed. So for me, the questions are very hard and continuing ones, and let me say I appreciate I haven't suggested any answers about what to do, how judges are to rule with these open-ended provisions of the Constitution. I mean, suppose, as in China, it were made a crime to have more than one child in certain parts of the country. Uh, suppose, as in India, uh, under Mrs. Gandhi, uh, the government required vasectomies or other operations to prevent too many children from being born. I put it to you that we would conclude under our constitutional law that there is legal protection for the individuals subjected uh, to, the, to that legislation. But I concede to you that there is nothing by its terms in the Constitution narrow enough that I can avoid using the open-ended clauses of the Constitution uh, to get there. It is only because we have a due process clause only because the word liberty is in the due process clause, or only because of the Ninth Amendment, if a judge were to use that, that, that you get to that end. Now, you may not, that, that is in a sense illegitimate uh, thinking, at least from a scholar's point of view, uh, 
uh, maybe you shouldn't think about what the end is, but just think about the analysis. Find it, and you are only going to find it uh, in those clauses of the Constitution, which I believe too many people uh, are prepared to uh, abandon because of their very open-endedness and because to be sure of the danger that they pose that judges will just go and do what they think right at the time. So on this first go-around, I, I simply would leave you with my thought that uh, these are uh, hard issues, uh, not easy ones, that the, the end we should be seeking uh, is a way on the one hand to try to limit uh, judges from simply going and imposing policy judgments into the Constitution without uh, ignoring what I believe to be both the language and the intent of the Constitution, which is that there is a role and a significant role to be played by the courts, by the courts, in protecting individual liberties beyond those which are explicitly set forth in the Bill of Rights. Thank you. It's a pleasure to introduce uh, Judge Kaczynski of the Ninth Circuit, who has attained that status at a very youthful age after being Chief Judge of the Court of Claims and other distinguished positions when he was even younger. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I want to start uh, my remarks with a, uh, something I think will be of interest to you, a um, substantive due process uh, alert. Um, basically a report to you on the status of substantive due process in our federal courts. Uh, and I have both good news and bad news. Uh, substantive due process is alive and well and thriving in our federal courts. Uh, for those of you who think substantive due process is a bad idea, that's bad news. Um, but I know there are those of you out there who feel differently and um, you will be interested to know how this um, came about. Um, it's, it's really a bit of an arcane point of law and uh, um, I was rather surprised that, uh, that there was such a thing left. I had learned in law school when I was there last year um, that, that, that uh, substantive process had died with Lochner and it, it just uh, uh, it simply didn't exist. And I ran across a slip sheet by one of my colleagues only a week ago and uh, there was the word in, uh, in bold print. So I ran the cases back and tried to figure out what was going on. Well, it turns out a few years ago there was a case, uh, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, called uh, Parade versus Taylor. And for those who don't remember facts of cases by their names, I, I need to go through the facts a little bit. What happened is Taylor was an inmate, and he sued Parade, the warden, claiming that uh, a hobby kit he had ordered had been lost by the guards uh, by the, in the institution, in the prison institution, and he brought a 1983 action claiming a deprivation of uh, property without due process. Now, the uh, then Justice uh, Rehnquist uh, um, went through the uh, requirements for 1983 action. He said, well, a hobby kit is property. It is a thing, it's property, and therefore it certainly is that. Uh, the the uh, prison guards are employees of the state and therefore their action or failure to act, uh, even though it may have been negligent, uh, was uh, state action and uh, um, the law certainly was a deprivation. Uh, but, said the, the Justice Rehnquist, um, not all deprivations are prohibited, uh, merely deprivations without due process. And in this case, the prisoner had a uh, uh, right to go um, uh, under state law into state court and sue for the value of the kit, and he would have due process uh, subsequently. Uh, I, I should uh, note, uh, it's not germane to my point, but so no one's misled, a later case, uh, Daniels versus Williams, uh, overruled the part of Parade that said negligence was sufficient. You have now have intentional action. It's not germane, I just didn't want anybody to uh, 
um, to miss a point. Yeah, but um, uh, what is interesting about the case is the uh, concurring opinion by Justice Blackman, uh, in which uh, Justice White um, um, uh, agreed with here. I guess he concurred or agreed with. And um, this is what Justice Blackman said, and it spawned a line of authority that I think is extremely interesting. It says, I, just, it says Justice Blackman, I do not read the court's opinion as applicable to a case concerning deprivation of life or liberty. Um, I also do not understand the court to intimate that the sole content of the due process clause is procedural regularity. I continue to believe that there are certain governmental actions that even if undertaken with a full panoply of procedural protection are in and of themselves antithetical to fundamental notions of due process. See, e.g., Barty versus Connecticut and Roe versus Wade. Now, the history of how the, the lower federal courts have applied uh, Parat uh, is somewhat lengthy and I will have to abbreviate, but uh, at least um, a number of the circuits have read uh, the majority and the concurring opinions together saying that uh, uh, when you're dealing with questions of property, uh, there is uh, simply procedural due process uh, protections. On the other hand, when you're dealing with something called liberty or life, then, uh, then you are, uh, then you are uh, uh, getting into areas of uh, substantive due process and then merely having a subsequent state remedy is not enough. And uh, the cases are legion. There's a case from my circuit uh, called uh, uh, McCrory versus Shimoda, I believe, uh, and says substantive due process violations ordinary occur in situations involving deprivations of liberty uh, interest uh, rather than property interests. And uh, the case that called my attention to this whole uh, um, uh, area of the law was uh, a case released about a week ago by a panel of uh, the Ninth Circuit where the question was uh, uh, somebody had been allegedly killed by uh, police officers. The question was, uh, was the taking of his life a deprivation, um, uh, the kind of uh, deprivation that could be cured under Section 1983? And uh, the panel said, yes, of course, uh, as to his life, his estate could bring a 1983 action. And the close question was whether or not the children, the children could bring a 1983 action. And uh, the court, after a good deal of thinking about it, um, determined that uh, the, the, the right to have a parent, uh, parental relationship was an interest. It was an interest protected by the Constitution and that it was a liberty interest. So it characterized it in this fashion. Now, I want you to think a little bit about, about this paradigm because I'm going to get back to it. And I, I want to talk a little bit about the theory, at least my theory, of how um, one ought to be interpreting constitutional provisions. And I guess the problem, as I see it, goes back to Chief uh, Justice Marshall. Um, uh, again, thinking back to law school and constitutional law, I would ever so often raise my hand and uh, say uh, things like, but professor, you know, this, this can't be right. Uh, the, uh, it's just not in the Constitution. And the professor looked down at me and said, but Chief Justice Marshall said, it is a Constitution we are expound, uh, expounding. As if uh, the fact that this was a Constitution ought to lead us to treat it in a much different way than, uh, than any other document uh, that uh, is used for uh, governance. Now, I think that uh, leads to basically two different perspectives which I think have, uh, have flaws. And if one looks at them from either of those perspectives, one misses the point of what the Constitution is all about. On the one hand, one can have uh, Professor Gralia's uh, rather uh, suspicious approach of anything in the Constitution that's not quite there in explicit terms. You view it in the narrowest, uh, most suspicious, most limited terms, and, uh, and give not an inch that is not, in fact, uh, uh, provided for. Um, on the other hand, you can have the vision uh, that Justice Brennan gave us in his uh, Georgetown speech. Uh, the Constitution is uh, simply an embodiment of aspirations, principles uh, of the best values of our society, and uh, leave it up to us judges to tell you what it is. I think that that misses the point that the Constitution is a document. It is a document written by men, not by the deity or 
another entity. Uh, it, is, uh, it is written by, it was written by men who understood the importance of words and the power of ideas. And that in interpreting, it, one ought to treat it pretty much the way one treats uh, other documents uh, uh, that are used to govern the affairs of, uh, of people, whether they be laws or regulations or contracts. It seems to me that if one applies some of the principles we heard about yesterday, uh, one, one can think about the Constitution in, uh, in terms which, uh, while not dictating a result, I think can give a method and a limitation to what courts can do and a guide as to what they ought to do with these open-ended provisions. Now, the first thing to understand, and I, I think it's, it's, it's uh, a point that was made by the Attorney General in his address uh, to the Federal Society last year, and it's a point that I don't think was stressed enough uh, by those who commented on the speech. The Constitution is made up of a variety of clauses and phrases and sentences, and uh, they have uh, varying degrees of generality. Some are very specific. Uh, some are much more general. The Attorney General mentioned the provision in the Constitution that, uh, that calls for, uh, that sets an age limit of, or a minimum age of 35, um, uh, for um, um, to be eligible to be uh, to serve as president, and he said, "Well, there's not much one can do uh, with that. Either you, you are or you are not, and nobody would say it's 29 or uh, 36 uh, or, or 28 or indeed more 36." Uh, I had occasion to think about that provision because another another part of the of the. Uh, of that clause caught my attention. There is a provision in the, in the, in the Constitution that says that uh, no person except a natural born citizen may be president. And uh, <laughs> uh, before I decided uh, to, to take the path I did, I, I, I wanted to study very closely my options. <laughs> And I, I looked at that clause and I said to myself, well, I, I was naturally born. <laughs> <laughs> but then it turns out uh, uh, I was, in fact, the result of a cesarean section, so that didn't work. <laughs> um, and then I said to myself, well, uh, it says uh, natural born citizen. And we know that if somebody is born abroad of parents who are U.S. citizens, then they too are U.S. citizens. Well, my parents are U.S. citizens. I know because they were naturalized the same day I was. <laughs> and therefore, I was born of them, and uh, therefore, perhaps I too am eligible. And I pass it by my closest friends, and even they wouldn't support the view. <laughs> Um, and then I came up with uh, yet another idea. It says, uh, there's a different clause, it says, uh, uh, as far as elig eligibility is concerned, a citizen of the United States at the time of the adoption of this constitution. Well, this constitution, of course, is somewhat ambiguous, I thought. Uh, uh, you know, the Constitution was passed, uh, it was then amended several times, and uh, this Constitution could refer to any part of it. And in fact, uh, I became a citizen in 1968, and the Constitution uh, was amended by adoption of the uh, Article 26 of Amendment in 1971 or thereabouts, and um, I thought maybe I can fit on that provision. Uh, again, it didn't pass a straight face test, and uh, I guess, uh, 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 you know, so I became a judge. <laughs> Uh, now, now, this shows that, you know, there are limits to, uh, as other speakers have pointed out, uh, the, uh, Professor Williams pointed out particularly, the, to, to what you can do with phrases in the Constitution. But it seems to me there are other provisions. There are provisions that, by their nature, are general, uh, um, uh, the language is general, and require judges to give substantive content to their meaning. And let me give you an example. The, the, I think that um, um, the Eighth Amendment um, uh, is such a provision. Now, I, I know that, uh, that there are, uh, and let's talk specifically about the death penalty. I know there are people out there who feel that the uh, Eighth Amendment means um, exactly what it meant when the Constitution was adopted. And so the Constitution said uh, the death penalty, uh, or provides for the death penalty in certain circumstances, surely that must not be cruel and unusual. Uh, without disputing that point, the, the, that is not the way the law has developed, and I think 
there's good reason for that. Uh, as our uh, as our courts have interpreted um, the Eighth Amendment, uh, the question poses is poses whether or not it is cruel and unusual uh, in the circumstances uh, of today. Now, those are pretty broad phrases, but they do have meaning. They do require the exercise of judgment, but judgment within limits. Look at the two terms, cruel. Well, I guess there's few people who dispute that the death penalty is cruel, at least when inflicted uh, against an unwilling um, uh, the victim. Uh, the question then becomes, is it unusual? And here Justice Brennan has consistently maintained that, uh, that the Eighth Amendment does not, uh, does not permit under any circumstances the death penalty. And his reasons for it, I think, are instructive. Now, on the question of whether it is unusual, I suppose there's a wealth of information out there. There are a variety of states that have passed death penalty statutes. Uh, death penalties have been carried out uh, in various states uh, for a number of years. Uh, three justices of the California Supreme Court have been uh, denied retention, I believe largely on the basis of their record in death penalty cases. And on the basis of that information, I think one could conclude that uh, the death penalty is not unusual uh, in this day and age. But if Justice Brennan feels differently, it seems to me that that is his prerogative. He is on the Supreme Court and he has to exercise his judgment. If he looks at this wealth of information and decides that no, um, in the broader context or in a particular vision of uh, how reality uh, operates, if his view is that the death penalty is indeed cruel and unusual, uh, I, I'm not prepared to second guess him, even if I were able to do so. But Justice Brennan is a very honorable man. Uh, he does not say that. What he told us in, our, in the Georgetown speech is that by voting consistently against the death penalty, he's adopting a vision that is not, in fact, today shared by the majority of um, people in our society. And it seems to me when he does that, he has departed from even the very general language of the constitutional text. If he has said that it is not unusual and not cruel, and yet he's deferring to some other value, then he has no longer applied even the discretion that's allowed to him. So it seems to me that um, in interpreting constitutional provisions, you have to look at how general, how specific the provision is, and you have to have a degree of textual fidelity. You've got to apply the language as there. If it's narrow, you've got to apply it within such limited discretion as you, as you have with narrow language. If it is broader, you have to exercise, or you can exercise the discretion that's al allowed you there. But you can't pick a different standard. Now, the other um, uh, two requirements seem pretty obvious. It seems to me that you ought to, um, you ought to interpret uh, constitutional provisions consistently. Uh, you ought to uh, not read particular uh, constitutional provisions that are of the same level of generality uh, in different ways. Uh, for example, the Fifth Amendment provides a wealth of protection uh, for the criminally accused, and our courts have given that a great deal of play. Uh, somewhat more forgotten is that uh, the Fifth Amendment also provides a uh, prohibition against takings uh, of property uh, without compensation. And that provision, although it's in the same uh, amendment and uh, part of uh, the same phraseology, is given a very much narrower uh, construction by our courts. It seems to me that one ought to do one or the other. Uh, one ought to treat them consistently. The, the other uh, uh, principle, it seems to me, just like any other document, uh, you ought to have the principle of completeness. Uh, you ought to not ignore parts of the document. So if there is a privileges immunity, and immunities clause, it's an abdication of uh, judicial responsibility to say that there is not. Uh, if there is a uh, contracts clause, one ought to deal with it. Uh, if there is a Tenth Amendment, uh, one ought to give it effect. Uh, if there is a requirement that uh, public use, uh, that, that land taken under condemnation clause be for public use, it seems to me that one ought to give effect to that language. 
Now, let me get back to, uh, uh, to um, the example I talked about earlier, the little pocket of substantive due process that we've seen developing in the courts and, and try to apply some of these principles. Now, I, I've been called uh, by one of my colleagues, uh, um, uh, Weil Lachnerreit, and uh, I took umbrage of that because I really had um, not given any cause for that. It was uh, a taking case, which I think Lachner has nothing to do with, but of course uh, I'm not sure he knew the difference. Uh, so I don't want to uh, give anybody cause, uh, at least today, to, 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 to call me that name, but I, I want to accept uh, for the time being the proposition that indeed there can be or there is a substantive component to the due process clause. Uh, I think there's a very good argument that there isn't, that due process means simply process and not substance. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Dr. Piloan, who I think is in the audience, has argued, I think with some persuasive force, that it is not simply due process but due process of law and the requirement of law has certain substantive components. Again, I don't want to get into that. Let's take it as given that, in fact, there is a substantive component to due process and go to the next uh, uh, question. Um, did the courts uh, apply uh, the provisions of the Constitution consistently? The, uh, getting back to the quote by Justice uh, Blackman, uh, he says, well, if it's property, it's, it's, uh, it's questionable, but if it's important interests like those um, uh, enumerated in Roe versus Wade or Body versus Connecticut, then uh, of course those are a wholly different plane. Now, accepting that uh, Roe versus Wade and Body versus Connecticut uh, do indeed uh, embody substantive, uh, uh, protect, uh, substantive interests protected by the Constitution, uh, property has an advantage. It is actually in the Constitution. <laughs> It's actually written in there. And it seems to me that the principle of consistency would require treating these invented interests, and I, I don't mean the term at all pejoratively, but these interests that have been found uh, by interlineation, to be no less important than the things that are actually written in the Constitution. Um, Moreover, it seems to me that to say life and liberty have a substantive component, but property does not, uh, violates the principle of completeness. Uh, the Constitution does, after all, prohibit uh, the taking of uh, life, liberty, or property uh, within, uh, uh, without due process. And if you have uh, only two of those uh, uh, provisions, you give effect to only two of those provisions, it seems to me you do more than just leave something out. Uh, life, liberty, or property, I think, uh, very can very persuasively be argued to encompass all rights of individuals. And uh, it's not clear to me that rights can be boxed in as neatly as all that. Uh, think, think about the poor, uh, the, pa the difficulty the panel um, of my colleagues had determining whether or not one's right to having a parent around is a property interest or liberty interest. It could be either. It could be both. It seems to me that the Supreme Court got it right in Lynch versus Household Finance. There are human rights and they take different manifestations. It's not possible to divide them into life, liberty, and property as, uh, as um, individual components. Now, uh, before I sit down, I want to, to pick up on some uh, uh, thoughts that uh, were advanced this morning by Judge Bork and uh, Judge um, and, uh, Mike Horowitz. Uh, and that is that there is, what Judge Bork said, there's nothing you can do about crafty judges. And judges who will not follow the rules are always going to find some way of bending constitutional provisions and they are going to be able to uh, to, to reach the results they want to. I think it's very, very important um, not to forget that whatever rules you come up with, uh, whatever uh, uh, principle, uh, whether it be a narrow one or a, or a broad one, is that the most important factor is that those who interpret the provisions of the Constitution and the laws be people who have a degree of honesty and integrity <coughs> and self-doubt, and who are willing to lean against their own instincts, 
who are going to be suspicious of a result that they are too gleeful about. Because it is very easy to be blinded to one's own uh, desires and wishes and intentions. And no matter what we say here today, if judges are encouraged by society and by the lawyers who appear before them to take things just another step further and make uh, 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 leaps that are not, in fact, uh, within the rules of the game, it'll happen. So we have to be careful whom we appoint and we have to be careful what we argue to those people. And what we, see is, uh, what we have seen this past year are some of the repercussions of self-indulgence, both judicial and, uh, and otherwise. Uh, I think the removal of three justices from the California Supreme Court is, is uh, in a way, a, a tragic event. It is a constitutional crisis of sorts for the state of California. It gives one governor five appointments within his term. I think the first time ever since uh, uh, the first governor. Um, it is a result, I believe, of self-indulgence. And it's important for those of us who interpret the law and apply it to avoid that most unpardonable of sins. Thank you. With the growing self-confidence of the Federalist Society, we not, don't have not one House liberal, but two House liberals. Uh, on top of that, we have a House liberal who's not even a lawyer, uh, Mr. Horowitz. I'm sorry, help him. I've had half of my opening line taken away. I wanted to say that since that seems to be the fashion here, I carry my Constitution around with me. After Mr. Abrams spoke, I went and looked in the Constitution to see whether it said that either not being a lawyer or having a beard was a disqualification for appointment to the Supreme Court. And uh, unless I've read carelessly, it is not. And so I want to make it clear that my hat is in the ring uh, <laughs> as well. Uh, as the last member of the panel, I see my role as dealing with the profound questions uh, that have been raised by my colleagues on the panel. And I think they have raised two. One is, why have various of us chosen to accept the invitation to speak on this panel? <laughs> and the second is, why did the organizers of the conference ask us to speak on this subject? And I want to say a brief word about each of those. First, as to why I am here, I consider myself not a liberal, but a libertarian. And as a libertarian, I expect not to agree with any audience that I address, including a civil liberties convention. But I also would defend to the death the right of any audience to hear me. And so having been invited, uh, I felt that I had no choice. Now as to the topic, uh, I can only tell you what my grandfather would have said. I think looking at the topic, he would have said, with all this trouble in the world, they want you to talk about the Ninth Amendment. <laughs> The, uh, I want to say a few words about how one relates interpretation of the so-called open-ended clauses to the notion of original intent or interpretivism. Uh, and I want to do that by making some comments on the Attorney General's speech last night. I was there. I waited through the whole speech, waiting for the chance to lead the audience in prayer, uh, which I never did get. But uh, I found to my surprise that I agreed with almost everything that the Attorney General said. Uh, I found his explanation of why we had a written constitution uh, and its strong purpose in preventing the emotions of the day from sweeping away our liberties to be pure ACLU doctrine, and I was delighted to hear it. Uh, I was also delighted to hear him say that the other two branches of the government had an equal responsibility to interpret the constitution and to conduct themselves in accordance with their view of the Constitution, even if the courts seem to give them greater license uh, to do other things. But when he, when he got at the end to his last, to his two examples that he related to the role of the Congress, that I discovered that the agreement on the general principles did not take you very far. You remember the Attorney General said that the Congress had to interpret the Constitution correctly, and he gave two examples. One was the appointment power, uh, and one was the war power. 
and he suggested, and I think has said elsewhere, uh, that he thinks Congress has gone too far in exercising its appointment power uh, and has gone too far in limiting, as the Vice President, I gather, also said yesterday, in limiting the President's power in the area of war powers. Now, the question then is, how can one take an original interpretation or an interpretive view of the Constitution and square it with what the Attorney General told us was the duty of the Congress under the Constitution. And I would submit to you that it cannot be done. If you look at the original language of the appointment power, it does not say, with the concurrence of the Senate, which shall be given if the Senate concludes that the person is not indictable and does not hold extremist views. It says, with the advice and consent of the Senate, period, full stop. That means one would assume that the Senate is free to choose to give its advice or not give its advice. Now secondly, if you look at what was the intention behind that language and look to the behavior of the early Congresses, the early Senates, you see that precisely they took that view. That Supreme Court justices, for example, were often rejected uh, in the first part of our history because the Senate took the view that it should decide with the President whether somebody should be a Supreme Court Justice and not whether they simply pass some minimum standard after which the President had the right to decide. So from where does come the view that the Congress has no choice but to go along with appointed or judicial views of the President. I think it comes from who is making the appointments and that the weight of people's passion on that issue changes depending on whether they like the President's appointments or do not like the President's appointments and that liberals and conservatives alike change their view on that provision uh, depending on uh, whose appointments are being made, and you, I could uh, show you speeches on both sides changing as a result of that. I do not think one can arrive at the principled position based on the original intent that the Senate's role is very limited. If one looks then to the war powers issue, here again, if you look in the Constitution, it lays out in great detail the responsibilities of the Congress in that area. And I think it is very hard to believe that anybody involved in drafting or ratifying the Constitution thought that the President of the United States could send Marines to Lebanon uh, without the consent of the Congress. Now, what people will say back is that the world is very different than the world which saw the ratification of that Constitution. And in the new world, the basic notions of the Constitution, that the President had to have the authority to act with secrecy, vigor, and dispatch to protect our interests, requires the President to be able to do things that he was not required to do at the time the Constitution was drafted. I think that may well be true, but I do not see how one can come from an original intent and interpretation of the meaning of the Constitution and the meaning of those, the intent of those who drafted it to the view often expressed by conservatives that the Congress is exceeding its powers when it seeks to put limits on the war powers actions of the President. That used to, of course, be the liberal position, uh, and people like Senator Taft thought they were taking the conservative position uh, when they said that the President was, in fact, exceeding its authority. But I don't see how you come to either of those views uh, by saying all the court is supposed to do and all the Congress is supposed to do in interpreting the Constitution is to interpret the plain language and the literal meaning and the clear words. Now let me turn then uh, briefly to the specific question about um, whether there are open-ended clauses in the Constitution uh, and how one is supposed to find out if there are and if so, how one is to interpret them. Now we were told earlier today that the basic principle of the Constitution are federalism and democracy and that one looks, should look in the Constitution to see if there are open-ended clauses knowing that the basic principles are federalism and democracy. Now I suppose that if you know those are the basic principles of the Constitution, you look at the open-ended clauses and interpret them in the light of that. Well, I read the Constitution again as I was sitting there. There's nothing about federalism and democracy as being the basic principles, and I don't know how reading through the Constitution one can know for sure uh, that that is the case. I would have thought that the basic principle of the Constitution was the protection of individual rights against the tyranny of the state, particularly 
uh, as it was being drafted until the Civil War amendments of the federal government, and that the problem was to draft a document which gave the federal government enough power to do the things that it had to do, but to be sure that the rights of the people as against that government were to be protected. And therefore, I would say, one looks at the Constitution, one asks the question, are there open-ended clauses, and how do you interpret them, in light of that overriding principle, that the purpose of the Constitution, the purpose of writing this written document, and not simply creating a federal government, was to be sure that the rights of the people, the liberties of the people, for which they had just fought a revolution, were to be preserved. Uh, and that to be sure they were maintaining democracy and to be sure there was a federal system. But the basic principle, the basic underlying purpose was in fact to protect the rights of the people as against the tyranny of the government. Uh, now, if you take that approach, or indeed if you take no approach and say, I don't know what the basic principle of the Constitution is, I think it is impossible to come to the conclusion that the intention of the framers was to say, that the federal government could do anything it wanted to do except those things which it was prohibited from doing by the Bill of Rights and by the few clauses of the Constitution itself which limit the power of the individual. For one thing, as we all know, many of the drafters of the Constitution thought you did not need a Bill of Rights. Does one really believe that they thought so because they believed that the federal government could do anything that it wanted to do except those few things that were specifically prohibited by the language of the Constitution and that the necessary and proper clause should be read to say that all the rights and liberties that they had just fought the revolution for were to be taken away and that the federal government was to do anything it can do. I don't see how anybody could argue that that was the original intent of the framers of the Constitution. Now the question that worries judges is where should they find this additional authority? Uh, to somebody who has not had the benefit of constitutional training, the Ninth Amendment seems the clearest place to do so. Uh, the Privileges Immunities Clause seems to be next, uh, and one would have thought that the Due Process Clause and the notion that there were things written there that weren't to be seen but were to be invented by judges seems to me a less sensible place to find that. But I submit to you it doesn't matter. If we went back and said, Due process means only something very narrow. There are no penumbra in the Constitution. One would still have to say, what does the Ninth Amendment mean? What does the Privileges and Immunities Clause mean? And one would arrive at the very same place, namely that the framers of the Constitution did not intend to limit our liberties to those specific items enumerated in the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. And one would be left exactly where one is left now with the question of, how do you decide what those additional rights are and how do you limit those rights and what are the relative responsibilities of the, uh, of the court and of the Congress in determining that? And I would say that a major portion of the responsibility ought to rest with the Congress uh, and that the Congress does have a responsibility, uh, as does the court, to protect those rights against the states and that the court has the right and the obligation to protect those rights uh, as against the federal government. So that I think that one cannot simply solve the problem by saying all the court can do is say that you can't deprive women of the right to vote. Uh, it is, I think, inconsistent uh, with the intention of the framers, with the interpretation that one must give to the language which says that the enumeration of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others. One needs nothing more to say that there is more protection in the Constitution than that which is specifically enumerated, and that the task of finding it and determining how to circumscribe it uh, is not easy, but it is one that judges as well as legislators have an obligation to do. Thank you. I think rather than giving panelists a chance to refute each other, we'll move straight to questions from the floor. Hello, my name is uh, Peter Ferrara, and I'd like to ask, uh, what role should the uh, doctrines of natural law play in interpreting the Ninth Amendment, and particularly for Mr. Halpern and, and uh, Mr. Abrams, what economic rights or economic liberties uh, might be protected by the Ninth Amendment? Halpern? Oh. Go uh, ahead. Mort, do uh, you want to do that? 
Incidentally, the yeah. panelists are urged to speak close up to the microphone because people in the back have a hard time hearing. <coughs> Let me say that I, I turn to the Ninth Amendment uh, only when the other amendments uh, seem not to speak uh, to a uh, particular uh, question. Uh, I happen to agree with Judge Kaczynski that, that, that the portion of the Fifth Amendment uh, which deals with takings has been significantly undervalued uh, by the courts <coughs> in our history. Uh, we need an interpretive process about what a taking is to be sure, and there are words in the Fifth Amendment as difficult to define as in other amendments, uh, but, but I share the view that, that there is probably more protection, indeed I would argue there is more protection, which at least the framers intended to give via the Fifth Amendment, uh, and I would argue the 14th of, uh, as regards the states, that has been afforded so far. That being so, uh, I wouldn't look very hard at the Ninth Amendment itself for an independent source of rights. One of the problems with the Ninth Amendment, which every critic has rightly recognized of, of, of the articulation, uh, say by me or others, of the importance of it, is that it doesn't tell you anything. It doesn't even lead you any place in particular Ex about what other rights are retained, unquote, by the people. All it at least tells you is that one should not hear the argument or judges should not construe the Constitution so as to say that if I can't find it in the first eight amendments, uh, it doesn't uh, exist. Uh, I have no specific response to your question about what economic uh, rights might be found uh, in the Ninth Amendment. Uh, as I've said, I'm more comfortable uh, uh, focusing in that area uh, on the Fifth Amendment alone. As regards natural law, uh, as your question rightly suggests, uh, there was at the time the Bill of Rights was adopted a prevailing view uh, as to natural law. Uh, indeed, it was one of the reasons, uh, not the only one, but one of the reasons that it was so clear to the framers of the Constitution that it was essential to have a delegated, a, a, a uh, national government of delegated powers so that it could not deprive people of those rights which were believed to be those of all people as it regards the principles uh, of natural law. Uh, again, uh, my sense is that uh, uh, the, you, you don't need too much more than the same body of history one would ordinarily turn to without regard to the phrase natural law, but the same body of history uh, as to the intention of the framers that one would ordinarily turn to as in interpreting the First Amendment or the Fourth Amendment or the Fifth Amendment or the Sixth Amendment. Uh, uh, those are imbued with notions uh, of natural law uh, and uh, I think that uh, without taking the position that natural law trumps uh, the, the uh, provisions of the Bill of Rights, uh, that, they, that, that the concept of natural law, which was held by the framers, probably should have been given more play uh, by our jurists uh, throughout our history. One of the questions that's always plagued me is, uh, suppose by the duly uh, established amendment process, we were to repeal the First Amendment, uh, 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 to pass the question of anything Congress can do. Suppose we really went through the appropriate amendment process and change the nature of the government itself, the structure of the government itself, by the amendment process. Is there anything in concept of natural law or intentions of the framers which can possibly be said to allow the argument even that certain things cannot be amended? Certainly the prevailing view is no, and surely Justice Black's view on that, uh, as well as most, if not all, members of the Supreme Court was no. Uh, and, and I suppose that's the right answer, but, uh, but I have to tell you that, that, that the readings that I've done on the, in, in the, in the, time, the intentions of the framers uh, leads me to think that, that their notion of the government itself, the nature of the government itself, uh, and of the limited nature of the government itself, and of the essentiality of a government ensuring uh, some basic principles of, of freedom is uh, such that uh, they would have been uh, deeply troubled by the notion that by simply going through the amendment process you can change the entire structure of the government. But I, I must say that I suppose that, that we could. It, it still troubles me. <laughs>
Let me just I, say, I just want to note that there are a large number of other one questioners. So. One place to look for those other rights, including property rights, is in the Declaration of Independence, which of course does list a number of them. And I think one could argue that those were some of the rights they had in mind. And I think we'd have the right to revolt at that point to those of us who wanted a First Amendment. <laughs> If you had the right to revolt, it wouldn't be re it wouldn't be revolution. You'd be exercising your right. I agree. We should revolt. I got a second microphone. I'm with the media. My pen name is Mark Twain the Third. Twain and I grew up together in the little town of Hannibal, Missouri, about 75 years apart. Now, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Halliburton, I would like to commend the ACLU on their announcement this past week that they're opposed to child pornographers. I was exceedingly disappointed, however, in their simultaneous announcement that because of your position against censorship, that once child pornography is published, the ACLU will defend the publication under the First Amendment. Now this position against censorship I find a bit paradoxical and hard to reconcile with the ACLU's position nationwide of censorship stands against any mention of the Judaic Christian principles in textbooks. Now my question is this, how many standards of ethics and principles does the ACLU have, or worded another way, does the ACLU have any absolutes that are unchangeable, or is ACLU truth totally relative? ACLU truth isn't relative at all. We distinguish between what the government can do and what people can do. And our view is that any person can say any prayer and read any pornography, if you want to call it that, or book that they want to in their own home uh, or in other places where citizens gather together. What we do not think is that the government has the right to impose prayer or particular kinds of prayer on citizens. So we have an absolute position uh, on, on both issues and they're, I think, wholly principled and wholly consistent. First microphone. Thank you. I'm Bill Laffer and my question is directed to Messrs. Halperin and Abrams. Uh, <laughs> what about us? Well, you can comment too. In fact, I'd, I'd like to know what you think. Um, Thank you. <laughs> dis <laughs> discussions of the Ninth Amendment always seem to revolve around the question of which rights are these other rights which the justices of the Supreme Court are supposed to be enforcing in addition to the, the rights mentioned in the first eight amendments. The puzzle I've been wondering about for some time now is why lawyers uh, who have had their law school training consisting of reading appellate cases always assume that the framers were talking to judges in the Ninth Amendment. Uh, what is wrong with interpreting the Ninth Amendment merely as a directive to future Congresses not to enact other kinds of foolish legislation that the framers didn't have the foresight to, uh, to prohibit specifically in the Bill of Rights? In other words, isn't it simply a message saying, don't assume just because we didn't include it in this list that it isn't a foolish or harmful or evil thing for the Congress to do. Uh, there's an argument which has occasionally been made throughout our history against uh, the, the rather well-established principles of judicial review. Uh, they were serious when they were first made. Uh, Jefferson was one who made them. They were, they, it, it remains a serious, if uh, historically rejected, uh, argument. But I think it's difficult to make the argument that one should interpret the Ninth Amendment in a fashion so differently from the way one interprets the other provisions of the Bill of Rights. If one believes uh, that the other provisions of the Bill of Rights are enforceable by the courts as against the Congress and through the Fourteenth Amendment as against the states, if, and, and that, that is our law at least, it's hard for me to, to uh, accept the proposition that the Ninth Amendment almost alone should be read as a simple admonition, a, a, a suggestion, a hope for the future vis-a-vis uh, -vis Congress. And, and it seems to me that applying Judge Kaczynski's principles of consistency, uh, that one should not do it. Yeah, you were. Uh, um, 
the second yes, microphone. Uh, uh, my name is Frank Marine, and I have a question for uh, all the panelists. Uh, in one way or another, over the last two days, I think virtually everyone has recognized uh, the need to place some principal limitations on the ability of judges to read whatever they want to read into the law or, uh, or, or strike down statutes according to their own pr uh, predilection. And Thomas Sowell, I think, in that regard, suggested today that it's not so much how you decide as whether or not it's original intent or something else, it's rather who is going to do the deciding. Now, I think many of the people in this room believe that fundamental policy ought to be determined by the political branches of government, being the executive, of course, and, and the legislature. In that regard, what specific, if each of you had to pick one means of placing a principled limitation on the ability of judges uh, uh, to, to put their own views into the Constitution or to strike down uh, statutes willy-nilly, what would that principled method be? And I'd like to throw out three for your comments. Uh, a long time ago, or even into the 20th century, the Supreme Court used to consistently say that statutes are presumed to be constitutional unless proven unconstitutional beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, that's a pretty heavy standard. It would seem to me that many of our problems would be resolved if we returned to that standard because very few statutes would be struck down, very few actions of the executive would be struck down if you had to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. That is, if intellectually honest judges were interpreting the law. And that would restore, it seems to me, primacy to the, to the political branches of government. The you, second, you, you would use a factual standard to apply to a legal uh, well, question? That, that you, is how do you prove a proposition of law beyond a reasonable doubt? I mean, well, is I, it, either, it either is constitutional or it's not. Well, it, I would take it from the analysis that the Supreme Court used to apply is looking at your, your traditional means of interpretation. What is the language? Uh, what, is the, what is the intent? Uh, 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 once you get to a point where you start, start trying to find the words. I mean, there are no the witnesses, words, right? Hmm? There are no witnesses. You don't have the framers here to testify. You look I'm, at the statute, right? How do you prove, how do you prove a proposition of law beyond a reasonable well, the, doubt? Uh, it would seem to me that most statutes would be upheld under, under that standard, other than in the clear case. Uh, as Mr. Uh, Professor Gralia said, if someone, uh, uh, what would a statute would be illegal? Would say, well, a woman can't vote, or if you, or, uh, uh, or uh, a statute which would uh, discriminate uh, quite clearly that people of the black race can't vote, or things like that, would leave most statutes. And again, I wasn't the one who came up with that standard. It was the Supreme Court itself who applied that in case after case. Do you want but to I shoot like out to your other two yes, limiting principles, the and then we'll the get the other two is to take off on the theory of John Hart Ely, who I thought made a convincing argument that even though judicial review was inconsistent in many ways with democratic self-government, that it could be justified when cases implicated uh, the discrete interest of minorities who cannot protect themselves in the political marketplace. Everything else is open game in the political marketplace. Now, he didn't say that judicial review should be limited to that, but what about that theory as a means, and it's not going to be easy to, to interpret it or apply it, but then again, it hasn't been easy to, to apply what they're doing uh, uh, today in the First Amendment area and everything else either. That as a possible limiting theory. And the third area is Congress asserting its authority to limit subject matter, uh, to withdraw or limit subject matter jurisdiction of the courts. So in other words, if you were to pick, easy question, two parts. <laughs> Since you uh, addressed all the panel, which is the only way I'm likely to get included. <laughs> <laughs> You first of all, I would say. I'll, I'll answer it. D definitively. <laughs> <laughs> you started out well by uh, saying, and one starts well by quoting Sowell, as you did, that the question is, uh, who shall decide? And uh, behind that, of course, the question, who shall decide, is the question, who shall make the basic policy decisions? And I think, as academics or intellectuals, we sort of lose sight of where we started, and I think we must remember that judicial review was unprecedented in, um, uh, in British law and most other systems of government, and that obviously it's a power of great potential and one that is not specifically provided for. You would certainly expect, I think reasonably, that if it were really expected that judicial review would be hemmed in in some ways the way the veto power is, for example, which is explicitly provided for in this provision for overruling the veto. There's nothing like that about judicial review. Now, the whole theory, since we seem to sort of agree generally on that self-government is the best form of government, 
I think, I personally think that's sound, but one could argue about that, but history seems to indicate that to me, and it's not really popular to argue against self-government. Then it should be very clear that the only way that judicial review can possibly be consistent with self-government, which policy-making important issues is not done by unelected lifetime judges, is if the judges, in fact, interpret a meaningful document, apply a meaningful document. Now, as soon as you go from that, it's one thing to say, that there are words and that there, there is a document here which has an understandable, fairly clear meaning. And it does, as I say, for all practical purposes. And it is, it's anti-democratic that the majority doesn't have its way, that we can't have Kaczynski for president, despite his uh, fanciful arguments, all invalid, uh, like Macduff could make it. Uh, the, uh, couldn't make it, not natural born either. The, uh, uh, the only justification, just keep in mind, the only justification, how do we justify the Supreme Court overruling the workings of the democratic process? What justification is there for that? And the only one anybody offers, I suggest, or, or most people ordinarily, is, well, they're interpreting the Constitution. And that's so or it's not so. And insofar as you're saying, but the Constitution has unenumerated rights, which the judges can discover. Well, obviously, you're talking about a very different thing now. You are talking about judicial policy making. And you, sh you shouldn't hide that. And then they come along, as Judge Kaczynski says, but what you've got to do is tell these judges they should have a lot of self-doubt. And they should be very careful. Well, that's not going to do it. Can you imagine Brennan and Marshall having self-doubt? <laughs> it's, it's hardly possible. <clears throat> now, John Hart Ely does not succeed in coming up with a theory, he says that judges ought to confine themselves to representation, reinforcing, or insular minorities. Well, you say they ought to, but what's going to make them do that? Nothing. And besides, representa representation, reinforcing, or insular minorities involves value judgments. Who is a minority? The loser in the political process in any question is the minority. And the only, one one can, the only way one can overturn that judgment is by reaching a different evaluation of the conflicting interest that created the problem different than the one the political process uh, arrived at. There's, there's no other alternative. I had the feeling I have an I sort of an impossible position that on the one hand, it's perfectly clear and easy. The question is simply, should judges be running the country? Which most people seem to think not. On the other hand, it's an awfully hard position, it seems, to get across successfully. Maybe because I'm a poor teacher, but because there's a lot going against me. Abrams can say, Chief Justice Berger agrees with him. Right? I've had it. Chief, Chief Justice Berger agrees with him on the Ninth Amendment. What am I to say to that? Only of, of nine justices, only uh, Rehnquist agree with me. Then my alleged colleague, <laughs> <laughs> Kaczynski gets up and he agrees with Abrams too. And indeed we see uh, the man in the street, or at least the man in the aisle here, <laughs> agrees too. Young man gets up this morning and says, why doesn't the Supreme Court wipe out the New Deal? Why not? <laughs> everybody, the point is everybody likes it. See, everybody says, gee, maybe the Supreme Court will do the nice things I want. And the alternative is to really let the masses govern. And the masses is everybody who ain't in this room. <laughs> Well, Professor Gali, I'm glad you have not joined of the ranks of those with self-doubt. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, we're hunting for formulas, and formulas are ultimately not, not going to do it. And, um, uh, you know, we can rail against it. We can say, well, you know, if we only apply a different standard or a different formula, uh, we reach the result we want to. It seems to me that we just have to treat the Constitution fairly as a governing document, and uh, it, it will lead to the wiping out of the majority well. But I, I you know, this, this uh, uh, great love of majority rule I sense uh, from Professor Gralia and uh, some others, uh, I, I guess I just don't entirely share it. I think self-governance is fine. A majority rule is, is a good thing uh, within limits. And that's what we have a constitution for. If not the majority, who, Alex? <laughs> well, 
And who, who's placing these limits on the majority, if not the majority? When we talk about majority, we talk about, that came from, the, from Mount Sinai. Well, the, when we talk about majority, <laughs> we don't talk about today's majority necessarily. We talk about transcendent majorities that have approved our governing document over two centuries. And it seems to me that the passions of a particular moment uh, do have at times to yield to, uh, to the That's wisdom of... of uh, uh, the, the, pa the passions of now, the moment. Which doesn't mean, doesn't mean that that can be overruled by amendment of the Constitution. All right, Alex, do you think that it is a reasonable interpretation of the Constitution that the judges are assigned a substantial policy-making function? That's the question. Now, whether Well, I know that's the question you would like to ask. You play these but, but, you know, games if you phrase about it that way. Excuse me? If you phrase it that way, you have given yourself the answer. Well, I think that's, I think, well, I think that's the why, question. Why do you ask that question? Because that's as a realistic, one. practical matter, to say that there are unenumerated rights or there are open-ended provisions, to be the least bit realistic, that is to say that it is the judges who decide. So what do you do with the Tenth Amendment? The Tenth Amendment is beyond our... Are. Well, no, I. <laughs> <laughs> That's not even one of the open ended. He was a fiction man. I was, actually about, <laughs> I was actually about to quote the Tenth Amendment. The problem with your position is that it's inconsistent with the original intent. We did not create a government which had all the power except the power which the Constitution reserved to the people. We created a government which only had certain enumerated powers, and all other powers were reserved to the people. And how you get around the fact. The judges have to decide whether the Congress or the state governments are exercising powers which were delegated to them. I don't understand. That, if you prefer that formulation of the question, we'll give you that formula. Congress passes a law. The question is, is it a power delegated by the Constitution to the Congress? And if you look at the Ninth Amendment, it says the fact that we didn't specifically prohibit it doesn't mean we delegated it. And the, therefore, the court has to answer that question. The answer to your question of how you avoid judges making policy is to appoint sensible judges. And you do that by electing sensible presidents. So, Mr. Howard, <laughs> <laughs>